Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lorraine Govindel, and I'm from the Cancer Association, and I work in health promotion. Thank you so much for joining today's webinar. August 1st has been declared as World Lung Cancer Day every year. People from all over the world commemorate this very unique day in an effort to prevent cases of lung cancer and reduce the risk. And the goal of this day is to promote self-screening for lung cancer while spreading as much information as possible about the disease. So today I would like to introduce our team. Emmanuel from EB, EP Digital is at the back house for all the technical aspects. They are in the wings to make sure everything runs smoothly. And uh, you will have an opportunity to post questions and we will select um, uh, how we're going to be answering it either via email or we will be able to answer them online. I also have with me at the background Cancer's Head of Marketing, Lucy Bologna. She's also here to support us on this day. Our lineup is quite interesting and unique. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Reinhard Erasmus and um, uh, he is from uh, Liberty um, and he's a lead specialist, he's the chief medical officer at Liberty, a seasoned medical professional. Liberty is one of our uh, seasoned uh, partners and they are definitely here to help and support cancer as we fight the dreaded disease. Through Liberty's support and sponsorship of ca cancer continues to provide access to crucial information around risk reduction measures that help people to ensure that they make informed choices. Uh, this partnership also entails giving access to post-diagnosis care services and provides mobile screening clinics across the country. He's going to share more information today about lung cancer, the risk factors, and also some information in terms of symptoms and, and the management thereof. Thank you so much, doctor, for joining us today. Hi, right, thanks, thanks, Lorraine. Um, um, are we gonna are we gonna get into it, or do you want to introduce the rest of the panel as well? No, we'll allow you to, talk, Doctor. Okay, okay, great. Um, uh, everyone, if you could give me a second. Um, uh, Emmanuel, I think it's asking me. Uh, Advanced, advanced sharing options, who can share host only or all participants? I'm not sure why it's asking me that. Uh, Dr. Reinhardt, um, you should be able to, to just share. So if you go share screen, then it should oh, give you a pop-up, yes. Okay, cool. There we go. Let's quickly do that. And we'll get into the presenter view. There we okay. go. Great. All good. Okay, fantastic. Just want to lower that. Uh, okay, great. Good day, everyone. Um, um, thank you for the introduction, Lorraine. It's a pleasure to be here and discussing such an important topic. Um, um, you know, uh, Liberty Partner partnering with uh, with cancer is, is 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 quite close to my heart. You know, the brand promise is all in it, all with you. Um, um, so in all in all of it, um, um, and uh, I, I I I think I can uh, I can easily um, and proudly say that I have been a, a proud yearly cancer Shavathon participant. Um, as you might see, that there's still some growing uh, growing hair that's 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 running out here to the side. Um, um, great, I think uh, we can get into it. Okay. Okay, um, um, I think we're gonna we're gonna start with some stats. We're gonna go from global to local. Uh, we'll run through Liberty and then and then we'll run into what Lorraine has mentioned for some of the the risk factors and then signs and symptoms. Okay. So according to the World Cancer Research Fund, uh, lung cancer uh, ranks as the second most common cancer globally, affecting both men and women. Uh, and in fact, it uh, unfortunately holds a distinction of being the most prevalent cancer among men. And the second most common cancer among women globally in 2020, 
alone, there was more than 2.2 million cases of lung cancer reported, um, uh, which really um, uh, emphasizes the urgency of addressing this pressing issue. In the South African context, the National Cancer Strategic Network has identified cancer as a growing national and socioeconomic concern. Among various other types of cancers, lung cancer has been uh, designated as one of the top priorities alongside colorectal cancer, cervical cancer, um, uh, prostate and brain breast cancer. So the South African Cancer Registry, which is a registry used in public and private, which records all of the South African um, recorded histologically recorded cancers, um, actually released statistics in 2020, which is um, um, uh, which is which is always a great reference because you know you have to ask but what does it look like by us? Um, um, so in South Africa in 2020, uh, 2,171 cases of lung cancer were diagnosed. This accounts for to about two percent of female cancers and 3.6 percent of male cancers, which reflects a global the global trend for for men being more. Um, um, uh, more affected by 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 this. Okay, so zooming in from a national picture, we can have a look at some of the insights from the 2022 Liberty Claim Stats. Um, uh, this is not just our small picture that we see in 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 in, in South Africa. Um, um, unsurprisingly, our our stats showed a significant decline in COVID-related claims. Um, uh, we we know that the that the the end of the um, global health emergency was declared by the WHO on the 5th of May uh, this year. And our, and our statistics have reflected this. However, with the COVID came, claims coming down, we have seen a resurgence in, 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 in cancer, cancer claims with the leading cause of uh, claims for both males and females at Liberty. Uh, so it accounts for about 28.8% of claims uh, attributed to specifically cancer. Uh, following closely behind, uh, we have cardiovascular diseases and um, disorders, which constituted about 22.4% of claims and respiratory disorders, which made up, uh, made up about 11.9%. Additionally, stroke and renal disorders contributed about 6.5% and 5.9% claims respectively. Um, so from here, it's, you know, previously the front runner has always been cancer. COVID really took over a little bit and, um, and we're seeing cancer again. So um, just, just staying on, on, on that trend, as we delve a little bit deeper into cancer claims, uh, we notice some gender specific trends. Uh, breast cancer takes the lead, accounting for about 49% of all cancer related claims among females and for men. We've got prostate cancer, which holds a significant prevalence, making uh, up about 31.5% of all approved cancer claims. This is followed by color, uh, colorectal cancers, skin cancers, brain cancers, and then lung cancers, which we do see as a, as a, as a smaller percentage. And uh, I'm going to touch on that just a little bit later as well. Um, you know, at the end of the day, if, we, if we're looking at 2 and 3% nationally, um, uh, that we're seeing lung cancers, you know, uh, uh, um, lung cancers in, uh, in in our smaller framework of five percent, and it does seem to reflect that statistic. Um, all of this just underscores the importance of regular preventative checkups and the need for women, um, um, specifically women, um, uh, in this case, if we're looking at breast cancer, uh, to make sure that they've got adequate cover coverage, especially concerning critical illness diagnoses, right? Uh, since 2022, following the COVID pandemic, uh, we've also seen a noticeable rise in uh, the number of critical illness and disability claims, which which ranges across across board beyond beyond the, 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 the um, cancer cases. Uh, so notably, um, you know, there's been an in, in inclination that we've seen in trends that many of these critical illness um, uh, cases we've seen actually. Uh, particularly for diseases, diseases like cancer, have been submitted at later stages of the disease. Uh, so, you know, we we can speculate. It's 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 it's. I wouldn't always draw direct conclusions, but we can speculate that during the the COVID time period, um, that people were maybe hesitant to go to the hospital, hesitant for screenings, hesitant to to go see their general practitioners, 
And now that we're a little bit out of the pandemic, um, um, we're reaching out to it and, and, and seeing some of the runoff of it. Um, uh, people are representing, and unfortunately, uh, people are presenting with 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 more severe symptoms and signs, which we'll touch on in, in just a little bit. Um, um, so yes, this this shift in the stage of detection highlights the impact of the pandemic-related disruptions on our healthcare access, and underscores the importance of a regular health screening to identify major uh, address health issues and early stages. All right. So if we pull this back to lung cancer itself, the majority of our patients with lung cancer have advanced disease, unfortunately. At um, um, this advanced disease may reflect um, the aggressive nature, the aggressive biology of, of the disease, um, and then also the absence of uh, frequent symptoms uh, earlier in the disease. Uh, so sometimes we, were, we, we would only see symptoms of the disease uh, when it's locally advanced or there's already metastatic disease present. All right. Um, I think we'll touch on that in a second. So understanding the risk factors is essential for our prevention or early detection of all cancers. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we know that genetic predisposition can play a role in individuals with a family history of lung cancer. Uh, having a higher likelihood of developing uh, lung cancer. Um, it's always worth to note that there is a percentage of people who develop lung cancer who have actually never smoked. Um, uh, it's about 10 to 15 percent, but again, smoking is only is only one part of it, right? So, like I said, the most significant risk factor for lung cancer is smoking tobacco products. Uh, primarily cigarettes, uh, both, both active smoking and exposure to secondhand smoke. Um, the risk of lung cancer disease also increases with the number of cigarettes smoked, as well as the lifetime duration of smoking. So, so we're talking about numbers here, and we're talking about length and time, right? Um, naturally, um, things that would be associated with, with these two these two factors uh, would be your age of your onset. So the earlier, um, the higher the, the risk, the degree of inhalation, um, which is just increases the exposure, uh, and then also the tar and the nicotine content in, in, in the tobacco smoke. Um, tobacco smoking is um, responsible for over two thirds of lung cancer deaths globally. Um, um, I, I find it uh, maybe a, a time to mention here is that, that smoking as a risk factor in itself is much further reaching than just lung cancer. Uh, it is the leading preventable cause of mortality globally. Um, I, think, I think we see a lot of WHO uh, and um, governmental um, uh, uh, drive uh, when it gets to when it gets to smoking legislation and 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 this is the main reason why why so it's implicated in over twelve types of cancers bladder colorectal esophageal oral laryngeal uh, stomach just to name a few it's responsible for ten percent of cardiovascular deaths worldwide and we're looking about thirty percent we just Sorry, Dr. Reinhardt, your, your microphone has gone um, mute, so we can't hear you. Actually, we can hear. All good. So is it just on my side? Yes, yeah, I'm all good. <laughs> no, phew. Oh, there you are. There you're back. Okay. Sorry about that. For some reason, I could not hear you. Okay. Well, thanks for... Thanks for um, Giving me a side of release, uh, relief, uh, you see. Um, uh, I wouldn't know where, where I should have restarted. So anyway, as we were saying, just smoking increases your risk for COPD, infections such as TB, diabetes, osteoporosis, uh, reproductive disorders, peptic ulcer disease, post-operative complications, and the, the, the list really goes on. Um, some of the other risk factors to just take note of, which have uh, it's definitely not something maybe so much in the forefront every day, but uh, there are other environmental and occupational factors, 
such as exposure to radon gas, asbestos, and air pollution, which is which is a quite a concern in our country, um, 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 uh, where this also can contribute to an increased risk. Okay, so whenever we talk about risk factors, the question always comes up: uh, How would I have known? How would have it, or, or what should I be looking out for? Um, um, so I like to split um, presentations and symptoms into, into two sections. You get your intrathoracic and then you get your extrathoracic. So meaning symptoms originating in the chest and symptoms originating outside of the chest. Like we've said, symptoms originating in the chest when it's still quite early uh, um, are, are come later or, 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 or uh, doesn't present as 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 early as and as um, so ominous as as some of the other disease uh, other symptoms. So intrathoracically, we're, we're talking about a wide range of symptoms, and there's nothing really very specific um, um, that you can just pinpoint that you know if you've got this symptom, then then you know you need to go to your doctor. So anything from shortness of breath, a new unresponsive cough, um, we've heard about smokers' coughs. Um, um, any change in your sputum, um, uh, uh, any chest pains, noisy breathing, wheezing, recurrent chest infections, and a loss of appetite and a loss of weight. Those, those, those two are, are, are ones to definitely take note of. Extra thoracic, uh, thoracic, so outside of the chest symptoms that uh, that patients can present with is generally when um, cancer or the, the 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 lung cancer has already spread outside of origin, so it has spread beyond. The, the primary lesion that's that's in the lungs. So lung cancer can spread to anywhere in the body, uh, but the most frequent sites are in the distant metastatic sites are, are in the liver, the adrenal glands, uh, the bones, and brain. So um, unfortunately, these patients present sometimes with neurological deficits or uh, night uh, night bone pain, abnormalities in their blood um, on a, on a bio uh, biochemistry level. And, and and so forth. Um, Lorraine mentioned that uh, um, you know um, uh, screening programs for 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 lung cancer. So the unfortunate thing is that in South Africa there is no official screening program that's 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 adopted. But um, uh, we have knowledgeable um, we have knowledgeable um, clinicians. So my first step is always a good physical exam is is is, is number one. Um, uh, listening to your patient, having doing a good physical exam. After that, um, uh, if the suspicion arises, if the history alludes to it, uh, if you're worried uh, on your physical exam, then in general the the um, the physician would would move on from there. So we're talking about any cytology, sputum cytology. So you would give a sample and, and they would send it away. In the sputum, sometimes they, they would look for either number one, are we just dealing with TB or are we dealing with cancer? Uh, or number two, if, if it's if it's cancer, they, they actually look for cancerous cells in your sputum, all right? Uh, which, is, which is always interesting. Um, and then you can always go then Beyond that, if anything is picked up, then generally uh, a spiral CT scan. I think a lot of people know this CAT scan. Um, you 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 will go into um, either that or a chest X-ray, uh, or if they're already wondering about other things, you might you might be sent for other further investigations. Right. Okay. So being aware of these risk factors can take a we can take proactive steps towards uh, reducing our chances of developing lung cancer uh, and promoting overall lung health. Regular checkups, like we've said, healthy lifestyle choices and avoiding uh, tobacco exposure is vital against the the fight for this this devastating disease. The prevalence of lung cancer and its impact on individuals and society at large is a global concern. Within South Africa, it is imperative that we address the rising burden of cancer and the rising detection of cancer with particular focus on lung cancer uh, through awareness, early detection, and accessible health care. By acknowledging these trends that we just discussed, uh, that we know it's there, we know it's global, we know it's South Africa, we see it in our insurance industry. Um, 
we can really invest in preventative measures uh, and we can really work towards uh, reducing the incidence and impact of lung cancer and other related diseases. So I think I would just like to mention here that, you know, when it comes to these, these, these very challenging um, uh, um, diseases like lung cancer, having a strong and supportive network is truly invaluable. This, this real difficult, difficult journey um, can be really made more manageable by being surrounded by your loved ones and your friends and your family. Uh, I think I think always the, the the love and the support and care and understanding uh, during these times can 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 really help can really help a, 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 a patient get um, get through this. Um, um, so I hope I uh, I left a little. Uh, if you had a, had a better place than where, where you were with, with regards to the risk factors. Um, uh, I think Lorraine mentioned that uh, uh, we might take some questions at the end and we can email some questions in and, and then we can always have a look if we can assist there. Thank you so much, Dr. Erasmus, for that very informative uh, slides um, with regards to lung cancer. Um, I just want to touch on two things that you spoke about. Um, so you, it was quite interesting. You mentioned the the late diagnosis, especially uh, you know due to COVID and the setback during that time, because we at Cancer also see that uh, we have patients that come into our care homes, and we do see patients that are coming in with quite advanced stages of cancer. But it's also a light bulb moment because uh, it, again it tells us the impacts of late diagnosis. And often, you know, uh, we find with lung cancer, people don't uh, always know that, you know, the signs and symptoms of it, and therefore present quite late with it. And I think your, your slides and the information that you shared definitely alluded to the importance of knowing the signs and symptoms. And I think uh, 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 in the South African landscape, the fact that we don't have routine screening for lung cancer uh, just by being aware of the signs and symptoms is important uh, for people to take note of. And that that forms part of self-screening, you know, for every individual. Uh, and I think that's that's uh, an important message. Um, yeah, Lorraine, I, I think it's it's quite it's quite frustrating. Obviously, you know, I think as as clinicians where you where you really want to do as much as you can. And I think cancer that really supports um, uh, as much as they can. Um, you want to catch people as, as as early as possible. The earlier is always better in cancer. Um, uh, and even if you can catch people before, which we talk about our preventative measures, even better. So, um, so yeah, no, that's interesting that you guys have seen it also at, at, at cancer. Um, um, but uh, I'll definitely take that back. <laughs> take that back to, back to the stats guys. I think they're going to be very interested in that. <laughs> Yeah, but, but I also want to share something else, Doc. Um, so in KwaZulu-Natal, we, um, we have volunteers that go uh, into some of our underserviced communities and they do door-to-door -door awareness on lung cancer and they also provide support. Interestingly, uh, we don't find many of the patients coming out to tell us about their lung cancer disease, you know, to get support. And I think a lot of that is due to the stigma attached to lung cancer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's important for everyone that's here today present on this webinar to know that we shouldn't be judging people, uh, you know, at the end of the day, nicotine is a drug. And when people start using tobacco products, they become addicted to it. And, um, you know, support is so imperative. It's something that you touched on in your slide as well. Um, you know, it's, it's really important for people, you know, who have lung cancer to actually go for support, uh, irrespective of the risk factors and circumstances. Yeah, yeah, definitely. People need to reach out. It's, uh, I hate stigmas. <laughs> <laughs> we can have a whole other session about stigmas, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, sometimes you just have to accept it is what it is and, uh, and you have to tackle it, you know, and this is where your family and your loving support network and, 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 and places like cancer really, I think, provide a, a very valuable, um, value, valuable service. Uh, with regards to the, the symptoms, you know, it's such nonspecific symptoms sometimes that, you know, if, you, if you're ever uncomfortable and, you, and you're not sure, Go to your doctor. Go to your doctor and, and, and ask them to, to, to have a listen, have a have a look. 
Um, uh, I think when it when in doubt, go check it out. Yeah, definitely. And I think that 80% of our population depend on the public sector and, you know, going to the clinic uh, is, is so important. And and we always say your body talks to you, but I don't want to take the space uh, from Susan and she's going to talk more about it. But I think it's important to seek, um, you know, services, especially the primary health care clinic, uh, asking them, you know, to screen you or to check you up, uh, sending your sputum through. Those are important uh, things that people can take note of. Uh, even if they don't have access to a professional, um, you know, to a doctor. Uh, a lot of our areas are rural as well. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you Great. so much, Doc, for that. We really appreciate your um, Thanks, knowledge and appreciate the day. Okay, so I'm going to now introduce our next speaker, and she is Susan Waltz. She's a cancer patient living with lung cancer. Susan is 60 years old and lives in Johannesburg. She has a son, Andrew, who is 30 years old and is the light of her life. So she's currently not working, but has had a very successful career spanning over 40 years in the financial services industry. Susan is a foodie. She loves good food and is passionate about sharing her knowledge and experience with others. Thank you so much, Susan. I hand you over now to our panel that are here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lorraine. Um, I really appreciate being able to address this webinar today. And I see a theme coming through here, a theme of support, awareness, exactly what um, Dr. Erasmus said. And I, I'm sure the others who are talking after me are going to carry on with that whole thing about support and awareness. I have an incredible support system. Um, but we're not going to go there now. Anyway, as you said, um, I was in a rather demanding and rewarding career for 40 years in the non-life insurance industry. Um, my last position being held was that of a senior underwriting in cell captive environment um, in risk finance. For those knowing the short-term insurance industry will know what I'm talking about. Um, and that was until the beginning of November 22, because that's when I was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer, just like that, all of a sudden. No symptoms, nothing. So um, until then, I'd been extremely healthy, walked five kilometers with friends a few times a week, no chronic conditions, no medications. The Most of what I had in my medicine chest was Panado. Um, the only time I'd ever been in hospital was when my son was born. So many people say to me, so if you had no symptoms, how did you get diagnosed? How did you find out that you had cancer? So towards the end of October last year, my mom took ill and um, she lived in East London. So off we went to East London and she passed away at the end of, of October. Um, and on my return to Johannesburg, I, I arrived home on a Tuesday evening and I just got into bed. And that's where I stayed for the next five days. I was exhausted. Um, I kept on thinking, well, it's, you know, from my mom's passing, um, and that's just, you know, contributed all because of the funeral, etc. So I went back to work on the Monday. Um, and during the day, I still thought, you know, something's not right here. You know, Lorraine, you said just now, listen to your body. Just, yes, listen to your body. Take time out and listen to your body. I, I, just, I just didn't feel right. I was exhausted. So I thought, you know, I'm just going to go to my GP and ask him to check me out. And maybe he can help me a bit. So off I went the following day, um, and he did the usual checked ear, nose, throat, a blood pressure, listened to my chest. I said, no, I think we need to send you for x-rays because something's not sounding quite right in your chest. So let's have bloods and x-rays done. Called me the next day, called me into his office and um, showed me the x-rays and said to me, we see a mass over here. And... Um, a lot of fluid in the cavity. We need to see a pulmonologist immediately. Um, I, I think at that stage I probably didn't even know what a pulmonologist was, but anyway. <laughs> um, I eventually trying to get to see a pulmonologist was mission impossible um, because they booked up for months and months in advance if you don't have um, if you're not a current patient of these. So, so that was quite a challenge, but eventually I got admitted to e, through ER 
and um, I saw the pulmonologist that night after having had further x-rays and blood and he said to me that I had primary lung cancer stage four because there was also lesions it, it's the tumor is larger than five centimeters on my right lung and I had further lesions on my left lung and I had pleural effusion. So that culminated having the pleural effusion, I needed to um, have the fluid drained and they drained off about the, um, I think it was three liters of fluid over a period of three days. I mean, it's, it's been the most awful experience ever having this drain inside your body, having this bottle around with you anyway. Um, and on the fifth day, they discharged me and told me to come back the following Tuesday for a biopsy. Now, because I'm not terribly medically inclined and I haven't been ill and haven't had tests and all these kind of things, I thought, oh, the biopsy, they're going to stick a needle into me and um, take out a sample of whatever they need and send it away, and then the biopsy will be done. Um, so when I got into hospital, the doctor did explain to me that they're going to make an incision in my back between my ribs. I didn't think too much of it. And um, anyway, after I came out of theater, I discovered that I'd been in theater for two and a half hours. And um, oh, okay. Sorry. Anyway, so that operation was like the worst thing in my life. Um, I have never had so much pain in my entire life. It, it was awful. Anyway, came out of hospital and got referred to the oncologist. Um, I saw... I saw the oncologist in the middle of December and my first dose of chemo was um, on the 22nd of December, three days before Christmas. Thank goodness for the support of my sister, Ruth, and my whole family, because I don't know what I would have done. Anyway, um, but having that chemo on top of just having had the toracotomy just a short while before that, oh, it was hectic. Um, I was really not capable of looking after myself at all. Anyway, and um, the chemo that I had was a limta and um, carboplatin, which was not pleasant, really, really not pleasant at all. Um, let's see now. I was very fortunate with... Um, with the chemo that I didn't lose my hair. I lost quite a bit of it. It's just very thin now. Um, but I didn't have to have my head shaved or anything like that, which is great. Really, really, very fortunate. But it's also a bit of a challenge because how you see me now is I look pretty normal. If you look at me, um, no one will say I've got stage four lung cancer. And, and th this is quite a challenge when you see people that you know, and especially ex-colleagues, et cetera, and they're like, wow, you look awesome. When you're coming back to work, we can't wait to have you back again, et cetera. Um, but people don't know what's going on inside, inside physically or emotionally, you know, mentally, anything like that. Um, it's, it's really quite a challenge. I mean, a simple task of going to a mall and doing a couple of things is like impossible you know not impossible but on some days it's it's really not difficult but other days it's, it's it is impossible but um anyway um to help with the emotional side of things i am seeing a counselor and um i make a point of talking about my cancer like i am today yes i get emotional and things like that but um I want people to understand how I feel. I want people to know. Uh, people, you know, I said there's a theme coming through here, support and awareness and, and things. Awareness is the most important thing because if people aren't aware of, of what, what you're going through, they, you, they can't relate to you. They can't understand. And it's going to make your life miserable. And that's why I'm like really so bent on, on sharing what I'm going through and and. In, being able to share with people what other people are also going through.
Um, at the beginning of my talk, I mentioned that I didn't have any other symptoms other than the fatigue that I experienced after my mom's funeral and things like that. But in hindsight, if I go back and think about things, there, there are things that could have indicated to me that something was not right. So like I said, I used to walk with friends um, five kilometers, easy, five, six kilometers every now and again, keeping up with them. And at one stage, I started not being able to keep up with them anymore. And I tell them, go on, I'll meet you on your way back. You know, I'll, I'll catch up with you later. This hill's too much for me, you know. And, and I kept on being like, why am I so unfit? I'm getting more and more unfit. I must walk more so that I can get fitter. Meanwhile, this poor little lung was squished up in the corner. It had a tumor in it. And, and the pleural effusion was, was squishing it, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> it wasn't getting in very much air at all. Um, and then going back to what I think um, either what you said, Lorraine, or what um, Dr. Rasmus said, it is just so important to take time out and listen to your body because you're not always going to have those, those external symptoms and your body will find a way of trying to tell you that something is not right and go, go to your doctor and see them. I mean, I had had my annual screen, normal screenings of my medical aid um, previously in, during you know, the previous years and things like that. And I'd also seen my GP a couple of months before that. Um, but it's just one of those things that you need to sit down and you need to listen to your body and, and work it. If anything, just, just do that. But a message that I like to pass on to other cancer survivors is do whatever it is to keep positive because being positive makes the journey so much better. Focus on anything and everything that makes you feel better. It's a difficult road to travel, but by focusing on being positive and sharing with information with others so that they're aware of how you feel and what you're going through is, is very important. And I just want to say thank you to Cancer for everything that they do for all the cancer survivors and the awareness and, and support that they do give. And I hope that my story helps somebody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. We, we so appreciate that you are so willing uh, to share your story and experience. You're definitely helping to inspire so many others uh, and for us to learn all about um, the importance of knowing your cancer and you know knowing your body and understanding mm -hmm. what you know changes are taking place. And again, to make sure that we go for checkups. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I want to really stress that um, it's so difficult out there for people to even go for checkups. It's it's been a trying time for them. But again, the clinics definitely have you know are there to support mm -hmm. people. And something that you, uh, you know, it's been quite an emotional journey for you. Thank you so much for making the time to share that story with us. And I think for the people that are here today, just to know, um, you know, Susan has shared that she's at stage four lung cancer. And often when people think are diagnosed with stage four of any cancer, you know, the next, it's, it's quite fatal. People of, often think the next thing is death. But today you have given us hope. And you have shared such an inspiring story. And, um, you know, I really want to say thank you to your family as well for, for the support that they've given you. Um, and Susan, you also touched on stress. You know, uh, you went through such a stressful period in your life. And we often find that our patients as well, you know, when they, when they come through to us and tell us about their cancer diagnosis, it's often during quite a stressful time, you know, that they um, experience the cancer incidence. So thank you, and we really um, look forward to your support, um, you know, joining our support group. We want to definitely, I know Gretchen is looking forward to establishing a um, lung cancer support group nationally. A lot of people have asked us about it, and we definitely want to look at that. And again, to the rest of the people that are here today on this webinar, don't forget cancer also has a telecounseling line, and I'm sure Lucy will share that with everybody. Um, and, you know, so for those of us that may not have the family support, cancer's uh, telecounseling line is definitely a lifeline for people. Thank you, Susan. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'm mindful that we're also going to be having load shedding in a lot of areas from 2 o'clock onwards. So our next um, speaker is Tato. 
Um, and, you know, we, we're talking about lung cancer and uh, Dr. Erasmus also touched on smoking as a risk factor. And he's going to share a short story with us. Um, he's from a community, also uh, Soweto, I think. Uh, but he's going to tell us more about where he's from and what has been his experience at community level in terms of tobacco products. Thank you, Tato. Uh, thank you very much. Uh... I am Tato Mago, and uh, greetings to, to everyone. And thank you for, for the opportunity to, to voice out uh, uh, the, the impact of tobacco products in my, my, my community. I am not from Soweto, I am from Atridgeville, it's in Pretoria. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very uh, 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 small, Township that is inclusive of uh, squatter camps around it, and uh, it is it is not far from the city. Uh, as much as I, I am here to to represent the same young people that are that are, uh, from the same environment uh, or setting of environment that I'm talking about. I uh, would like to say we are in solidarity with uh, 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 patients of lung cancer and everybody who is affected by it, because it is also very much vital for us to always uh, 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 share our, our, our stories in terms of how uh, 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 cruel some, some things are and how, how uh, uh, dangerous they can actually become, because in most cases, some of us, more especially young people, we perish because we lack such vital knowledge. And now I, I just wish uh, there were more young people from my community who can join just to hear and understand uh, 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 things that affect them mostly. Yes, yeah, so we have seen that uh, the, the, the new tobacco industrial revolution has begun and it is in it intends to to maximize profits through their newly developed uh, smoking products that attract and target young people our young people in in my community are very much interested in consuming this tobacco product since the development of what we call vaping and what we call a uh, hubby so they are more interested in smoking that and it is actually too harmful to them to an extent that you can actually get a uh, 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 young people very 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 young i can't say a uh, 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 youth but teenagers from 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 a uh, 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 second the first first uh, uh, grade secondary level who who you, you, you find smoking this hubbly thing. There's a, there are events, they call them hubbly sessions, and they literally smoke hubbly on the street. Why? Because they are very much interested in those uh, 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 smokings because the celebrities smoke them all the time. So they think they are cool and they belong when they start uh, smoking such. And in my community, I can just say that uh, with a deep uh, sad heart that uh, uh, this tobacco things really really contributes to to the poverty because as much as uh, uh, the, the the research done by world health organization says up to 14 percent of children from families who are who who who, who 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 farm tobacco do not attend school these kids, if they don't attend school, they work there in those uh, plantations. And then when, when they work in such areas, we all, we, we all know and, and, and there are researches that proves that uh, being very close to, to, to uh, wet uh, uh, tobacco leaves can cause you a lot of skin diseases. So it means that uh, our, our, our people are disadvantaged by the same uh, 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 tobacco industry that claims it, it, it participate in, in, in developing the economy of the country. And at which we now, we now know, uh, according to research, that one in two children uh, uh, are exposed to secondhand smoking 
which is also proven to be one of the most uh, dangerous way. Uh, and, and, and it is also one of the ways in which you can acquire such sicknesses caused by uh, tobacco products. And then also, we must uh, 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 remember very much uh, 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 that uh, in, in the townships, it is a, a, a setting which I believe we are affected by poverty in most cases. So a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot of people te- find themselves experiencing what we call chronic poverty. In other ways, a poverty that is not easily uh, 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 overcame. When, when a, a family loses a breadwinner, they start struggling. Those very people become a burden of the state. The state has to make sure that it provides for, 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 the, for the offense. It has to ensure that uh, uh, those people have shelter. It has to ensure that they have food. But the main cause of such, uh, uh, it is the same tobacco that causes a, a, a diseases for people. So one of the, the key reasons we, we, we are very much in solidarity with, with, with people who, 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 who experience a, a, a lung cancer or one of the reasons that we are in solidarity with people who are affected by, 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 by the, 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 the lung cancer or they have a patient of lung cancer at home. It is that we, we, we are a, a smoke-free a youth orientated society. In other ways, we, we, we have groups of young people who are advocating currently for, 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 the, for the tobacco products and electronic delivery control bill. We, we, we seek to, to ensure that we educate young people about the causes of, 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 of tobacco or, or diseases or sicknesses that are caused by tobacco products. So we, we, we actually believe that through education, more especially education of such caliber where we have a, a real life experience, I believe a, a, a lot of young people will be saved. And I believe that it is actually vital that a, 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 as, as, as much as we, 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 we are trying to, to ensure that young people become involved in activism and raising awareness in terms of uh, 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 eradicating the, the, the existence of tobacco, even though it is very much uh, 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 not easy for us to, to find ourselves uh, in the shoes where we say we are smoke free. But the fight will, will have to continue. My, my, as, 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 I, as I conclude, I would, I would like to say as much as in, in, in most uh, squatter camps, there are a lot of, in, in fact, if I can, I can just uh, estimate, I can say 80% of people who live in this very township are smoking, either be it a, 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 a cigarette, a vape, or a hubby. And at which a cigarette is it's, it's what I hate most because the, those cigarette baths are actually a toxic waste. Uh, those, those, those toxic waste, uh, uh, obviously, when, when kids find them on the street, they start imitating uh, the smokers, thinking that it is a cool thing to do whenever you don't see them. So how about those little kids who find cigarette baths on the street? How about them? How do we ensure that they are protected? How do we ensure that our, our, our environment also is protected? How do we ensure that our fish is not in danger when, when it is raining because of this toxic waste? And uh, uh, lastly, as much as we, 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 we are also part of a, a campaign now called uh, a, a, a What is in My Smoke, it is championed by young people who want to who want the industry to expose themselves to tell them what is really in this in this thing they are smoking so that we compare these chemicals in the uh, cigarette and those ones used to make a nyaope so that we are able to say that if it is possible we declare cigarette illegal 
that is uh, uh, my submission. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Tato. Um, apologies for the area that I got incorrect there. But it's great to see our youth actively involved in taking care of their own health and also educating each other about ways to lower their cancer risk. And I think you've really highlighted the plight um, you know, of the community members. You've also stressed on um, you know, we in, in an environment where we need money, where we need to put food on the table, people are now using that same uh, disposable income to buy cigarettes. And then we're looking at child-headed households as a result of the loss of loved ones and breadwinners as well. And, and those are all the things that we, we don't often think about, you know, the consequences of what, what we are doing and how it can harm us. Um, so thank you so much for that. And I know that in, in some of the people that are here in the webinar are volunteers. Some of our health promotion volunteers are also uh, on this webinar today. And, you know, they are also important ambassadors and uh, you have stressed the importance of education. And that's one of the uh, core components in cancer in terms of educating the public on how to reduce your cancer risk. So thank you so much, Tato, for sharing that, um, you know, what really takes place at community level. And we really value the efforts in terms of advocacy and lobbying for uh, legislation, because that's what's going to protect everybody. Thank you so much. So um, without further ado, I am mindful of load shedding and I want to now introduce our next speaker. His name is Thomas van Heistian. Thomas is from Development Gateway and he will share his latest research, research on e-cigarette trends in urban South Africa. Thomas is an analyst at Ferdale Conduct Consulting and a PhD candidate specializing in development economics. Through his role at Ferdale Consulting, he's working as the country lead of the Tobacco Control Data Initiative in South Africa. The Tobacco Control Data Initiative currently works in six African countries to advance tobacco control by providing an interactive portal that collects, analyzes, and presents data and information on tobacco control through rigorous primary and secondary research. Thank you so much, Thomas. And I know that the Cancer Association also uses a lot of the data from your website uh, to help us in terms of our education. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the introduction and for inviting me to present on this very important day. As I said, my name is Thomas van Heesten and I work on this the African team of the Tobacco Control Data Initiative or TCDI. And the TCDI is led by Development Gateway, which is an IREX venture in partnership with the Research Unit on the Economics of Excisable Products at UCT. And in line with the theme of today's webinar, I'm going to be presenting some results from the recent South African e-cigarette survey of 2022. Before getting into the survey, I'm just going to provide a little bit of background. And here I'm going to talk about the relationship between youth and e-cigarettes, as well as the health risks from e-cigarettes. So just in terms of youth and e-cigarettes, as Tato mentioned, youth are particularly vulnerable to e-cigarettes. And although there is limited data from South Africa about e-cigarette prevalence amongst the youth, data from developed countries such as the US has shown that between 2011 and 2020, e-cigarette use among high school students increased from 1.5% to 19.6%. And another study from the US showed that in 2017, approximately a quarter or 25% of all grade 12 learners were using an e-cigarette within the previous 30 days. Another study from an African country now and from Tunisia in 2016 showed that among high school students, 58.8% had ever used an e-cigarette, 38.3% had done that so within the previous 30 days, and 20.5% were regular users of vapes. Another thing to note about the relationship between youth and e-cigarettes is that the adolescents genuinely believe that e-cigarettes are less harmful and less addictive than cigarettes. And again, among Tunisian high school students, it was shown that 78.4% of them believed that they were less harmful and addictive than regular cigarettes. And the final thing to note here before I move on is that e-cigarette shops in South Africa have been shown to target the youth. And an important fact in this regard shows that 50% of all e-cigarette shops in South Africa are within a five kilometer radius of a higher education institute. The next bit of background I want to show has to do with the health risks from e-cigarettes. And this is extremely important because the tobacco industry and the e-cigarette industry in particular generally markets these products as healthy alternatives to smoking. But there are serious and severe health consequences posed to both users and non-users due to the inhalation of secondhand aerosols. 
So some of the risks from e-cigarette smoking include the exposure to inhaled toxicants and particularly various types of carcinogens. E-cigarettes have also been shown to lead to an increased risk of cardiovascular disease and lung disease, including acute lung injury, as well as various forms of pneumonia. Now, these three health risks are not only from e-cigarettes with nicotine, but also have been found from nicotine-free e-cigarettes. In terms of nicotine e-cigarettes, further health risks include nicotine addiction, exposure to second and third hand aerosol, risk of nicotine poisoning in children, and burns and inj injury, amongst many others. Now, as these are relatively new products, the long-term health consequences are not yet known at this stage, but there's a strong correlation between lung cancer and using of vapes that has started to um, emanate in recent research. So with this in mind, and the need to collect data on e-cigarette prevalence in South Africa, we at the TCDI conducted the South African e-cigarette survey of 2022. And just a brief overview, in terms of the survey description, we conducted the survey between January and September in 2022, and the main aim was to provide data related to the use of electronic nicotine and non-nicotine delivery systems and heated tobacco products, which we refer to as e-cigarettes, amongst adults in urban South Africa. And at the same time, we also wanted to track the use of traditional or combustible cigarettes. In terms of our sample, we collected a nationally representative data set of adults living in urban South Africa, and to do this, we conducted a telephone survey of people residing in metro and non-metro urban areas in South Africa. So after calling about 400,000 people, we were left with a final sample of 21,263 respondents, which had completed interviews. So in terms of some of the results, the first results I want to show you have to do with static prevalence. And this chart here shows the prevalence of e-cigarette users, combustible cigarette users, and dual users. And I'll just focus on e-cigarettes here. But what we see if we look at the top left-hand box, is that more than one out of every 10 South Africans in urban areas have ever tried an e-cigarette, with 11.3% of respondents having ever tried an e-cigarette. If we follow the arrows down, we see that 4% of respondents were current e-cigarette users, 1.5% were regular users in the past, and 5.8% were experimental users. Now, if we follow the arrow down from the current user box, what we see is that more than half of all current users were also users of combustible cigarettes, and that's the prevalence of dual users was 2.3%. So 2.3% of people in urban South Africa smoke combustible cigarettes and use e-cigarettes. The next chart here shows the demographic split of e-cigarette users in terms of various demographics. So what we see here, and if we look at gender first, which are the orange bars, we see that e-cigarette prevalence was significantly higher amongst males in comparison to females. In terms of race, which are the blue bars, we see that e-cigarette use was least common amongst the black population group and most common amongst the colored, white, and Indian Asian population groups. In terms of age here, which are the green bars, what we see is that e-cigarette prevalence was significantly higher amongst the younger um, age groups compared to the older ones. And prevalence was 7.7% for those aged 18 to 24 and 6.7% for those aged 25 to 34, and then decreased substantially. The next set of results I want to show you have to do with dynamic prevalence, and this is important because in addition to the e-cigarette industry promoting these as a healthy alternative to cigarettes, they are promoting e-cigarettes as a smoking cessation device. So they are saying that these devices can be used to help people quit smoking regular cigarettes. So what we do is actually explore whether this is in fact the case. And before I show you the results, there are two terms to be familiar with. The first is an on-ramper and the second is an off-ramper. So an on-ramper is defined as someone who used e-cigarettes with no history of smoking combustible cigarettes and then started smoking combustible cigarettes. So these people used e-cigarettes, they had not yet smoked combustible cigarettes, but after smoking e-cigarettes, they then started smoking combustible cigarettes. So they essentially on-ramped to combustible cigarettes. An off-ramper, on the other hand, is someone who smoked combustible cigarettes with no history of e-cigarette use, then started using e-cigarettes and later quit smoking combustible cigarettes. So just to recap again, these are people that smoke combustible cigarettes that not yet used e-cigarettes. They then started using them and after using them, they then quit combustible cigarettes. So these are what we classify as off-rampers. So they essentially off-ramped from combustible cigarettes using e-cigarettes. And this is what the e-cigarette industry wants us to believe. So looking at some of the results here, the first chart I'm going to show shows the sequence of use for those using e-cigarettes first. And this is how we will identify potential on-rampers. So our starting point here is that 5.5% of urban South Africans regularly used e-cigarettes, either in the past or currently. 
Of that 5.5%, 39% had no prior history of combustible cigarette use. So these are the potential on-rampers should they start smoking combustible cigarettes. And what we see is that approximately one in five or 19% of these people then started smoking combustible cigarettes. So these are the people we identify as on-rampers. And just for interest sake of on-rampers, 88% were still smoking cigarettes when surveyed and 12% had quit. So the key message on this slide is that of those with no prior smoking history, approximately one in five or 19% started smoking cigarettes after using e-cigarettes. On the other hand, we look at the sequence of use for regular smokers now, and we use this to identify potential off-rampers. And our starting point this time is that 17% of urban South Africans regularly smoke combustible cigarettes, either currently or in the past. And of that 17%, 17.3% started using e-cigarettes after smoking combustible cigarettes. So these could be potential off-rampers should they then quit smoking. And what we see is that approximately one in eight or 13% then quit combustible cigarettes after using e-cigarettes. So what the initial message shows here is that of respondents who started using e-cigarettes after smoking combustible cigarettes, one in eight or 13% then quit smoking cigarettes. But importantly, quitting smoking is hard and relapse is common. So most clinical trials only characterize lifetime smoking cessation for people that have quit for longer than six months or a year. And in our sample, 44%, so approximately half of off-rampers had quit within a year um, prior to the survey. So smoking cessation is actually not certain for these people. So then going back to the question of asking whether these are actually a cessation tool, what we see in terms of on-ramping is that of those with no prior smoking history, approximately one in five or 19% started smoking cigarettes after using e-cigarettes. In terms of off-ramping, which is what the e-cigarette industry wants us to believe is happening, we see that of respondents who started using e-cigarettes after smoking combustible cigarettes, one in eight later quit smoking. But as I said, lifetime smoking cessation was not actually guaranteed for half, approximately half of them. So the true stat is that only about 7% later quit smoking cigarettes. So what these results are are leaning towards is that instead of being an off-ramping or cessation tool, e-cigarettes are actually making people start smoking combustible cigarettes. Moving on to some final results now, I just want to present some usage statistics and I'll do this very quickly. But the first chart here shows the time after waking up until an e-cigarette user or combustible cigarette smoker uses their respective products. And the main message here without going into too much detail is that 50% of combustible cigarette smokers and 40% of e-cigarette users use their respective products within 30 minutes of waking up. So this highlights the dependence people have upon these products and the addictive nature of these products. The next graph here shows the nicotine strength of e-cigarettes used by e-cigarette users. And what we're seeing here is that more than a third of all e-cigarette users do not actually know the nicotine strength of their e-cigarettes. So 36% do not actually know what the nicotine strength of the e-cigarettes um, was that they were using. The final chart I just want to show here shows the reasons which e-cigarette users gave for starting to use e-cigarettes. And what we see here is that the primary reason people started using e-cigarettes was to stop or avoid smoking regular cigarettes or tobacco, with 50% of e-cigarette users giving this as their reason. But as I showed in the on and off ramming section, this may be, not be the most effective tool for helping quit smoking. Other key reasons for starting to use e-cigarettes included the fact that it comes in nice flavors, curiosity, the fact that it looks cool due to the influence of movies and social media, as well as enjoyment and because a friend or family member uses them. So I've just presented a brief summary of some of the results from the e-cigarette survey, but on our website, which is the South African TCDI website, which can be accessed via the link on screen here, you can find much more information about tobacco control in South Africa across several themes such as health, illicit trade, the impact of agriculture, e-cigarettes and prevalence. And then for more information about e-cigarettes specifically, you can look at our e-cigarette page, which is also available via the link on screen here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, so I'm a little bit in the dark here because I don't think you can see me anyway. <laughs> we have load shedding in Durban. So um, please forgive me if my sound is interrupted or, yeah. You are but... looking, uh, Loren, you're looking good and your sound is <laughs> okay. okay, thank you so much. So Thomas, I think um, I really want to uh, extend our sincere appreciation for uh, what you've just shared with us today 
Um, and you know, it's it's often um, the way the industry markets the product um, as an uh, as good as well. Uh, but your 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 data has definitely shown us uh, another aspect in terms of the dual usage, uh, which is what we are also afraid of. And then also touching on some of the um, you know the factors with regards to the fact that you know the carcinogens from uh, both uh, nicotine and non-nicotine devices are equally harmful. Something that people don't think so. Even if they thought you know what I want to use this tool to quit smoking, um, it still can be harmful to your health. Uh, and and that's so important to you know to share. with the public um yeah so assistance but we will we'll hear more about it um and i want to thank you um thank you for uh, the data because you know when we talk um and we spread messages and we educate people it's the data that we need to show them and just looking at the prevalence among the youth it's it's a huge concern um and we definitely am so thankful that we have this opportunity to share that information today on the webinar and i know that this information is also going to be on our website for everyone to view uh so thank you so much for that um yeah uh so now i just want to just say that um i want to thank all our speakers um and we know that there are questions on the chat box uh lucy has shared our head of marketing has shared important links um, in terms of you know where people can go to should they want more information, but I also want to use this opportunity because we have a little bit more time to say that uh, cancer forms part of the Protect Our Next um, Alliance, which includes the South African Medical Research Council. Um, uh, it includes the National Council Against Smoking, the Heart and Stroke Foundation, the South African Tobacco Youth Forum. We are all uh, members that are really uh, trying to push to ensure that we have stronger legislation. And we're also using the opportunity to educate the public in terms of the harms. Um, if you want to really uh, be the voice, please go to our website. Um, you, can, you have the opportunity to send through a submission because the legislation is currently in parliament uh, and we have until the 4th of September, which is the closing date. So please make your voice heard and go through to our website and send through a submission to show that you are in support of stronger legislation because today's webinar has certainly showed us the harms of, of the tobacco products. Uh, we also want to thank Novratus for giving um, the lung cancer a platform to be heard and to give more patients and family members access to education and hope. Uh, and uh, definitely uh, there has been so many pointers that were shared today um, from various speakers. Um, if I could just allude to some of that, uh, you know, doctor uh, has, has shared information on the risk factors. He's shared information about the, the need for support and also Liberty coming on board to look at what is some of the common incidents in terms of the dreaded disease uh, and the cancers, um, the late diagnosis and what impact it has. And um, also looking at Sue and her sharing the information of what her journey has been like um, uh, through lung cancer. And we know tobacco use is definitely responsible, not only for lung cancer, but for over uh, 16 different types of cancers. Um, we can't even stress how important it is, you know, not to use the product itself. Uh, we also want to thank Tato because he's given us uh, a synopsis of what it's really like in, in the community at that level, what the pitch is like, and what are some of the struggles and challenges that they are faced with. But yes, they are still coming on board as the youth and, and doing a lot of advocacy work to educate the public. Um, and then again, uh, I want to thank um, uh, Thomas for sharing important information on e-cigarettes because Because it's, it's everyone's concern. Uh, and to you that have been the participants on our webinar, we want to thank you for, for listening. And I'm sure we're going to be addressing questions. Um, Lucy, I want to just hear from you if there's anything that we should share right now before we close. Nothing at the moment. Thank you, Lorraine.
Okay, so if you want more information, please uh, go through our website. Uh, it, it will be available as a YouTube link. Thank you, Emmanuel, for all the background support and to everyone that's been present. Thank you so much. Breathe in. Lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer deaths worldwide and numbers are rising, particularly amongst women. But there is hope. Breathe out. In South Africa, lung cancer is not diagnosed or reported often enough. However, the risk of lung cancer can be lowered in as many as 90% of cases. Smoking is the leading cause of lung cancer in South Africa, but there are other causes too. No one is risk-free, but with awareness and action, everyone can be. The lungs can't be seen or felt, making it tough to detect lung cancer until a persistent cough, chest pain, or unexplained weight loss occurs. South Africa has a high rate of TB cases, meaning that patients are often screened for TB first. If lung cancer is detected, you'll be referred for specialist care. The good news? There's lots you can do to prevent the disease. Stay away from harmful chemicals. Follow a healthy diet and move your body every day. Knowledge is power. If diagnosed with lung cancer, remember, you can win the war. Work with your healthcare team, follow your treatment plan, accept help, be kind to yourself, breathe deep. We're with you. <sighs>